Hello and welcome to Concept Cars. I'm Howard Stableford and in this series so far we've looked at prototypes and innovations from Japan, France and Britain. This week we fly stateside to investigate what one of the big three companies, Ford, has contributed to the collective mix of concept cars. Henry Ford was of course the man who was first to introduce mass production to car manufacture, bringing the price down to affordable levels. The Model T was an astonishing worldwide phenomenon and if you're ever in the Detroit area you really must get to visit the Henry Ford Museum where you can see the very first Model T, which was in red actually, not black like many people believe. The Ford that President Kennedy was assassinated in and a whole load of rare and definitive cars that shows how Ford have generally hit the right buttons with the car buying public over the years. Now Henry Ford was pals with Thomas Edison and the inventiveness of Edison must have rubbed off on Ford and his successors. Let's leap forward to the 1950s to see the unveiling of an astonishing new concept. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the big moment we've all been waiting for. You are going to see the most fabulous dream car ever made. And I think you'll agree with me that if tomorrow is going to look like this, it can't come too soon. And now, here it is, the X2000. Yes, this promotional film is for real, and you have to remember this was produced when the world was full of wonder for the idea of space flight, with the public lapping up awful science fiction B-movies featuring cardboard spaceships on string and actors dressed up in silver foil pretending to be robots. And in the car world, fins were in, like in a big way. If it looked like a rocket ship, it had the nation's vote. What really turns me on about the X2000 is, is really the fact that they designed it and it was so ridiculous. They, they made like two models of it. Um, one, according to old footage, virtually love size. And then it was so ridiculous that they never used it. Uh, like the idea of the pods on the back wings is just, you know, th this is a prototype, or this is a copy of a prototype, but you can imagine that now as looking at it like this. But what a lot of people don't realize is when they were thinking of that, that would have been available possibly as an estate car, probably as a pickup truck, as a four-door. And, and it's just bizarre that someone could design something so artistically ridiculous for something that was going to be an everyday vehicle. The X2000 by Ford is one of those cars that was more of a marketing exercise than a, a serious attempt at making a concept car. They even made a film called The Stylist in which this car is meant to be the the sort of the, the designer's dream come true. And throughout the film they show this designer scratching his head and all sorts. And eventually he comes up with this. It was only ever a quarter scale uh, clay model. And they show it spinning round and, and uh, they, they mock up all sorts of bits to show what motoring the future is going to be like. Andy Saunders has gone the full way and he's taken what the only two pictures he knew of the car at the time and built the real thing around it, the full-size thing, and it's fabulous. I got the passion for weird cars when I was a kid. Um, like in this country we had Lady Penelope's Rolls Royce, um, it was on TV. Um, all the custom magazines from America were doing features on prototypes as, as well as other stuff. Um, all the wild stuff that George Barris was doing, he'd done obviously an awful lot of custom stuff but he'd also done a lot of prototype work uh, and just the wild stuff really appealed to me. It's not surprising that motoring giant Ford has had its fair share of concept vehicles but some were a little stranger than others. The Probe 3 for example. In 1981 Ford launched the new Ford Sierra and what it replaced was a three box family saloon loved by the country. Everyone thought it was a great car and they were quite happy with it. So when Ford launched this revolutionary new jelly mold design, they knew they were going to have an uphill task to get the conservative British public to accept it. So what they did was they took a basic Sierra shape and they clothed it in this gold 
color and sort of really extreme bodywork with twin fins at the back. Flat, um, the wheel arch is all fared in and really sort of futuristic appearance in every possible angle, but still recognizably a Ford Sierra. And what the message there was, subliminally for the British public was, this is the way the cars are really gonna look in the future. And today you can get a taste of it by buying the Sierra. It's not as extreme, it's got all the features you, you're happy with, plus a whole lot of new things, but it's leaning towards the way the, the car's going. Now everybody sort of rocked against it and didn't like it to start with, and the Sierra wasn't an immediate success. But Ford were right because within three years, all the major manufacturers had designs that mimic the Sierra's goldfish shape. And another one of their more unusual concepts was the Ford Seeker in the early 90s. The 1990 Ford Seeker concept car is a concept car with a bit of a difference. Basically, it took a car already in production, the Mondeo Estate, and they clothed it with all sorts of new lifestyle extras. There was a there was um, an awning that could be pulled out. You take the stereo speakers out, plonk them outside. This was a lifestyle vehicle. And it was, it was all about sort of saying how the cars are almost here. We could almost do this for you now. And this is the way your car can, can take you down this lifestyle route. It's not just a car from going, for going to work and going shopping. This is a lifestyle leisure vehicle. All the things you see here today in this 1990 Ford Seeker are possible. One of the more way out designers is concept cool man Andy Saunders. He's built a few strange and wonderful beasts in his time, including the crazy X2000. Now he's building an Aurora. The passion for the Aurora is, is one that is the only one in the world and, and is a genuine prototype. Um, and just the fact that, again, it's, it's so crazy. It's um, seven foot six inches wide and 20 foot long and yet he was trying to make the safest car in the world and it's just bizarre that it's almost a contradiction. The Aurora actually has a fascinating story behind it. Here's Andy with his heavenly tale. Are you sitting comfortably now? The history behind the Aurora uh, was that it was built over a period of time by a priest in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Um, he he had been offered a job at General Motors in the styling department uh, and at the same time as he was offered that he was uh, ordained into the church and he decided to go with the church thing so he became a priest but he had a passion for car design and he wanted to build the safest car in the world for his parishioners to use um, it was his second attempt it took him four years um, at the cost of 30,000 American dollars in 1957 when it was launched um, and he just wanted to save car. It was on the road for a year, went to all the Autoramas and Motoramas. Um, he never took an order, and the company went bankrupt, and um, the FBI were supposedly called in on a case of fraud. But th there, there was no fraud as far as anyone knows, it was just the fact that some of the people that went to his church put money into it to try and get the project off the ground. Um, the car was put into a, a garage for repair work in the early 60s. 60 or 61, and as far as anyone knows, it stayed there until I bought it in 93, um, where it had sunk up to its axles in mud. Andy Saunders has embarked on an amazing project, restoring the Aurora concept car. It was only ever a concept car, but it was meant to go into production. Fiberglass, American, 1950s. It is without doubt the most hideous car ever imaginable. <laughs> After World War II, the company was in a pretty poor shape, and it was this car which symbolised the rebirth of Ford in the post-war era. The Ford 49 was a huge family sedan with more bells and whistles than a whistles and bells factory, yet was more affordable than ever to the general American public. So the 49 has taken its place in the warm and cosy nostalgia department of most older Americans' brains. Enter a new concept car from Ford. The Ford 49 is the modern interpretation of the classic 1949 Ford. The curves and the lines evoke the past, but are clearly modern. The chrome has fortunately become fashionable again. The interior is both retro and futuristic at the same time, and cutting-edge technology is ever-present, but in this case, only subtly on show. 
But if the Ford 49 concept was a good idea, the Thunderbird project was an even better one. Detroit, Michigan. The Raps have just come off a new concept that celebrates an old icon. This is the Ford Thunderbird concept car, the rebirth of American automotive legend. The T-Bird was first built in 1955, but it's now back for the 21st century, and it looks like it's not going to stay just a concept. With a new Thunderbird, you're looking at an automotive icon. And uh, if I were to look at American cars over the last 50 years, there are probably maybe five or six that uh, would come to mind. Uh, this has got to be at the top of the list. From Ford Styling and Engineering Center in Dearborn, Michigan, comes another Ford First, a car designed for those who appreciate the distinctive in personal transportation, the new Ford Thunderbird. This historic footage shows the introduction of the 1955 Thunderbird. We have to remember how important this car was for the era in which it was launched. When this film was first shown on American flickering black and white screens, countless viewers would have had their tongues on the floor, astonished by the car's lines and overwhelmed by an irresistible urge to save up and to buy one. There's obviously a more modern proportion to this vehicle than the original. Uh, we call it modern heritage because we're really picking up the essence of the original vehicle but recreating that with modern detailing. So the new concept car has taken many design cues from the original model, in the same way that, say, Volkswagen kept the original feel of the Beetle. The Thunderbird concept is a two-seater with portholes, with a removable hard top and the trademark T-Bird badge. Owners of original Thunderbird cars were consulted by the Ford Motor Company to ensure that the new concept would retain the essence of the all-American sports car. It was desperately important not to mess this project up with such an inspirational American icon. After all, even President Kennedy loved the Ford Thunderbird so much that he included 50 of the cars in his inaugural procession in 1961. I think we wanted this car to be immediately recognizable as a Thunderbird from 100 yards down the road. There, there would be no mistake as being any other car but a Thunderbird. Even the color, sun mist yellow, had been chosen as a favorite hue from the 1950s, even though the promotional films from that era were still in black and white. This beautiful little T-Bird, man, this is the performer's performance. If you look at the design of this vehicle, and you look at the design of the original 55, you'll find that they both have a very similar uh, value in them, and that value is optimism. Jay Mays and his team even washed old Thunderbird cars blindfolded to get a more accurate feel of the classic curves before they went back to their design studios to work more on the modern concept car. Now, this is indeed another story that has a happy ending because the demand has been so high that Ford has now bought out this concept with a few minor changes to keep legislation happy as a genuine production car. The Thunderbird flies into the next century. The Detroit Auto Show. The world's eyes are on what the big names are going to unveil next. Our friends at Ford announced that their stunning concept will have a coupe, estate and pickup concept focused on, quote, connecting people, travelling with friends with the honest and friendly use of technology. Us journalists scratch our heads on this until we're greeted by this. The 24-7 concept. These square pod things? Fords? Surely not. But the concept was not on what the cars actually looked like on the outside, but what they could offer the driver and passengers inside. The car can be reconfigured depending on who the driver is. So mum, dad and the kids can all drive the same car with different designs inside and also different parameters for driving it. I love these back screen displays here of the, the speed and the internet web access here in the centre. You could also use satellite navigation in the future and even email the maps to where you're going to your friends. It's all part of the concept for Ford is not the car this year, it's the idea. It's where we're heading into the future, being connected all the time, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Within a few years, virtually every car and truck that the Ford Motor Company builds all over the world will have advanced voice-activated 
hands-free telematics systems that will cover a wide range of uh, services. Well, I think a lot of people do share cars and families, and uh, if you have to share a family, wouldn't it be better to be able to personalize it to your own uh, liking? Uh, certainly, we're showing three different vehicles. If the family would like to have all three, then we'd be happy to, to sell them those. But we're, what we're trying to show is the flexibility and the modularity of the system. How much research did you do into these sorts of ideas with, with real car owners? We did a lot of it. Uh, we talked to all age groups as well. And one of the things I keep pointing out to everyone is this really isn't a vehicle just for young kids. This is a vehicle for, for modern families. And uh, we, we know that people in their 50s as well as people in their 20s are interested in this type of technology. OK, let's get real now, Jay. For most people, surely they'd think much of what you're proposing would be non-essential gadgets. Beyond the display technology and graphics, the 24-7 employs advanced telematics and voice-activated controls. Ford's presentation of the 24-7 focused on the way that individual users of the family car would be able to customise the interior ambience, call up their own music from the internet, contact their friends and arrange to meet with them. With the ongoing fuss about using mobile phones and looking at screens on the move, is this really a good idea? Gee, officer, I, I didn't see the red light because I was, well, I was checking my shares on Yahoo! And do we really want the internet in our cars? Even if the passengers could safely search, it's not much fun surfing on a tiny in-car screen, is it? But assume they'll get over these very big practicality hoops. When could we see these systems on Fords? Well, you're going to see immediately, uh, as Jack mentioned, we'll have voice activation uh, immediately in Lincoln. It's coming very, very quickly soon after in Jaguar. Uh, we'll have it in Ford Focus in Europe. And uh, as this projection system that you see running here will be uh, probably in production in the next two years as well. Uh, the Internet, probably three to five years away. The 24-7 idea for a concept complete with its Postman Pat style cars may seem like pie in the sky, but you can bet that the designers here are taking themselves very seriously. I was getting uh, tired of the interiors of cars and how uh, old-fashioned they are in many ways with mechanical buttons. And The, p the point is 75% uh, of the people say they can't do without their computers, so why not get what's right and what works in computers into our cars? And that's what we basically try to do. Once you go to an instrument, instrument panel that is a projection screen, you could project anything you want, whenever you want. You could project a lot. You could project very little. The choice is up to you. But the final word on 24-7 has to be from Thomas Rushbrook, a graduate at Coventry University, who has devised a car share system with similar personalization modes to the 24-7. Wouldn't it be great if, when you hire a car, everything in the car was just as you like it? So what does Thomas think of Ford's 24-7? Um, well, in my view of the Ford 24-7, yeah, yeah, Jay Mays' concept, uh, it's a very product-orientated vehicle. Um, and I think it's the same with a lot of vehicles that are coming through the concept stage it shows these days. Uh, they're a lot more product-orientated. Um, the dynamics are being reduced and cars are seen to be more friendly, uh, that they have a more friendlier face to them and more seem to be more of a product than an object of desire. With Ford celebrating their centenary next year, they decided to have a bit of a clear out. These are all unique concept cars created by Ford over recent years. Here they are, lined up in a huge hall in Dearborn near Detroit, ready to be auctioned off. But don't worry, Ford aren't desperate for the cash, in fact all the money will go to charity but they have much more sensible reasons too. Uh, we've gotten together with Christie's and decided to uh, uh, auction off a lot of our concept uh, prototypes and, and models because we think it's putting it back into the hands of the people. These vehicles have been in storage, some of them for up to 40 years. They haven't been seen, some of them, in that long. And we'd like to put them back into the hands of people that are going to restore them and put them back on the con concourse circuit. Uh, a lot of these vehicles are, I think, emblematic of, of the progress we've made over the last 100 years. A great idea. At last, we'll get some of these famous Ford concepts in the public domain, such as the Power Stroke concept from 1994, the masked pickup. This reached $44,650 in the auction. Then there's the 1996 Indigo concept. This was created to celebrate 260 Ford victories at the Indy track. Get it? Indigo? This reached $88,800. 
Here's the Mustang Mark III concept in jungle green pearl. Designed as a spoiler for the new Pontiac Firebird, you'd have needed to shell out $491,500 for this beauty. But for only $68,000, you could have the Mustang Bullet concept, inspired by Steve McQueen's classic 1968 Fastback. But this had to be the star of the show, the incredible Gear Focus concept from 1992, and it's one of Jay Mays's too. If I look through the uh, vehicles that we have on auction on Sunday, two of my personal favorites are the uh, Ford Focus uh, concept that was done at the Ghia Studios in uh, 1992, I believe. And that vehicle was done by Taru Lottie. It is less an automobile than a piece of sculpture and maybe one of the most significant, outstanding uh, uh, concept vehicles of all time. This concept went, wait for it, for $1,107,000. What's the betting Jay May bought it for himself? Who'd have thought this incredible car is based on an RS Cosworth Escort? And Jay's right, this is more than just a car, it's a sculpture, a work of art. So now these famous concepts have been sold in auction and are now on their way to various collections around the world. Far better than just gathering dust in a warehouse. That's all for this week, but join us for the next edition of Concept Cars when we'll look at the creativity of BMW, meeting wacky American Chris Bangle, who is of course the design boss of the Munich-based giant, and investigating how the CS1 could eventually develop into a new BMW 1 series. We'll see you next week.